And, you know, just want to remind everybody, tonight as we're broadcasting, make sure you do mute your microphone in the background. We want to get the best audio and the best experience for everybody involved. We will have the chat box going, and we will have a time for your open Q&As in a little bit. But tonight, we're going to introduce the star of the show tonight, Peter Margaritas, the author of Offscript, Mastering the Art of Business Improv. Now, improvisation is a powerful tool that every human being leader should learn to have in their arsenal. And it's, it's something that we need to understand even in the business world more and more. It's something we all have used in meetings as speakers, as show hosts, but have we used it to the best of our advantage, our best of our abilities. Peter Margarita is the author of the best-selling books, and he has three best-selling books. And the most recent one is this off script, Mastering the Art of Business Improv. He is a believer that the improv is a powerful strategy to build bridges while understanding and fostering creativity. Peter also predicts that organizations will flourish by employing the powerful tools he puts inside of this book. Welcome to the virtual stage and their, his own book launch party, Peter Marguerite. Welcome, Peter. Thanks, Rich. Uh, Jamie, by the way, thank you very much for that wonderful testimonial. And remember, you flunked my class within 30 seconds of the first day, just saying. <laughs> So we were having a lot of fun backstage. Everyone was warmed up, ready to go, Peter. And here we are now celebrating your third book. Now, Jamie mentioned some things, but why did you really write this book? What, what, what really got you inspired to write it? Well, I published the first book, Improv is No Joke, about six years ago. And I saw the impact that it was having with organizations. And people were starting to, to buy into the concept that this might actually be more than comedy. And a few people said, you know, you might want to write another version, add a little bit more business, write another version, add a little bit more towards business. And then my brother-in-law, Clyde, said, great book, write it for business. So I took his advice, but I spent five years researching to make sure that I had all the, my thoughts, my beliefs were all documented, covered. And during the pandemic, I just had some free time. And I just sat down and said, it's time to write this book. And it, it was... It took 14 months from start to finish. I had more fun writing this book because um, I'd been thinking about it for so long. And, and, I'm, and I'm glad that I was able to do it now versus postponing it for a year or two. So congratulations out there. And as we mentioned in the backstage, the hardcover just came arrived today. And that's very exciting news for you. Congratulations on that. There it is. Yeah. So as, as you hold the cover up, why do you come up with the title of the book going off script? And when you look at it, it's not even spelled right, Peter, but tell us how you came up with that whole concept of going off script. Well, the, the, the original title of the book was Improv for the C-Suite. And it had been there for a while, but I had, I had was asking for advice from a group of people about what would be a great, great tagline. And I got some great responses back with this gentleman by the name of Jeffrey Hazlett. You may have heard of him. And he, he replied, I like the title, but he, he, he said, how about, you know, winging it or spontaneity? And that stuck in my head. I liked the brevity of it, but I didn't think wing it or spontaneity were the right words. So I just kept working through that. But it was really a, 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 a retired judge in Ohio when I was doing my research about Martin Luther King and about him going off script in the I Have the Dream speech. She mentioned that. That's what she believed he, he did because reverends, she asked me if I've ever been to a black church. I said, no, I've always wanted to go. She goes, well, what, what, they're trying to get the congregation to communicate with him. And he, she didn't feel like, people didn't think that he was getting that conversation from the audience. So that's when he, and a gospel singer behind him, Michaela Jackson said, tell him about your dream, Martin. And he pushed it aside and she goes, he went off script. And I went, oh my God, that's the title of the book off script. <laughs> that's how and that it really is out. and the book is phenomenal and, and you do break down the martin luther king most people do not know he did go off script that was one of the catalysts for your book either a great speech a powerful speech great communicator but he went off script yeah and it was, it, it's an interesting story because it was the night before the he was to speak in 68 in august of 68 and they were going over the speech and meticulously going through it and one of his one of his inner circle said, "Let's pull this I dream out. We, we've been doing it for six, seven months. Let's, we want something else in there because the original title was Normalcy Never Again.' 
So as he's delivering this speech, was supposed to be seven minutes, but he went 17, about two thirds into it, he wasn't getting the response back. And if you watch the video, throughout the first two thirds, you can see him reading. And then he gets to this point. And had we, I, we think he heard the halo, but at that same point in time, he just pushed it away and went into, and he never looked down again and went into the I Had the Dream speech. And it's written, and it's written as he improvised the speech because it wasn't in his prepared notes. But he pushed and then pulled and went forward. So that's a great example. But when most people think of improv, let's admit it, most people think about comedy and just wing it and the, the laughs and the gaffes. But that's not what you're talking about with a leadership philosophy of improv, is it? No, it's all about, well, I was expecting a Drew Carey comment there, Rich. I'm working on it. I, you know, because it's so obvious Drew Carey is here with us tonight. But, <laughs> but, but it's, it's really about leaders building a foundation of respect, trust, and support. And if you build that foundation, all three pieces have to be there. If one's missing, it, it collapses. But then that leads to listening and being focused. And truly listening to understand, getting rid of the noise, getting rid of the biases, pushing your ego away, pushing your agenda away, and trying to fully listen to what the other person is trying to tell you, all the while being focused. Because when we can do that, we can adapt to any situation. But the glue here is two magic words, yes and. Yes and is about agreement, but not always agreeing. Yes and is about empathy, understanding how somebody else feels in their shoes. Yes, and is about creativity, moving conversations forward. Yes, and is, Rich, have you ever been to the beach and watched the sun come up? Yes, I have. Can you look at that sun and go, that's the ultimate yes that's out there. It's, it's a new day. It's a new life. It's, it's everything's new at that point in time. So if that's the ultimate yes, then let's add the and. What are we going to do about it today? What are we going to, we have a new day. Let's attack it. Positive move forward in that manner and make a difference or make a change. Now, even on those cloudy days, the sun's still out there. So when you think of the sun as the ultimate yes, and you look at it every single morning, I mean, that should just inspire you just in itself when you put it in that framework of what am I gonna do? How am I gonna listen? Am I gonna be focused? I'm gonna treat everybody with respect, trust and support. And how can I change my business and take it to the next level? So I love the questions. I love the yes, no frame up of all you're doing that. And I know in chapter four, you got into talking about the death of ego and leadership, particularly those two in chapter four. I find it very compelling. So build on yes, no, and go to the death of the ego, if you would. I, I think you mean yes, and Rich, not yes, yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, that's my mother's version. Yes, no, you can't do that. Uh, but with, with ego gets in the way a lot of times. And we've actually seen a lot of it during the Great Resignation. It's, it's been well documented that uh, Jamie Dimon basically said, everybody's coming back into the office. I don't care. And people went, uh, okay, I'm out of here. Ego gets in the way because we want it our way, not in, in improv. It's, it's all about the team. It's less about me, the leader. My job is to make the team look good. My job is to support them and, and give them all the praise, the tools, so they can do what they need to do and it's less about me. What we see in leadership all the time, especially it's that ego leadership. I'm going to tell you what to do. You need to have your cheeks in the seat. This is, I want your ideas. And people bring their ideas to the meeting. And then the leader goes, no, we're going to do it this way. And in the book, I refer to that as someone who is an ask whole. But that's what it is. I like that. No, no, that, that, that's, that's very good. So expand on that a little bit more because I know you have seven foundations of the improv that help leaders out now. Now that you've set that up, maybe break down some of those foundations of what we need to think about within leadership. Rich, I, I have a lot of respect for you. I like you, which is even better, but you know, and I don't have to like you, but as long as I have respect for you, we can get things done. You know what? There's a situation where neither side has respect for each other. That's called our U.S. political system. It's my way or the highway. Nothing gets done. It's gridlock. Do you do business with people you trust or you do business with people you don't trust? Do you hire people that you trust or do you hire people that you don't trust? 
We hire people that we trust and we want to be trustworthy. We need that in that foundation and support. You need to support your team with everything they need to be successful in learning and development and in opportunities. And then they need to be able to support you. So that foundation is the granite to building a successful improv leadership organization or bringing that into the culture. The hardest thing people have, and, and I'm guilty of it, and I try to work on it every day. I used to be what I call a professional interrupter because my ego was getting in the way because I thought I had all the right ideas. And, and I just, would you just be quiet, Rich, so I can just get my word? I'm just going to interrupt you so I can just tell you what I think. And, and, and it came to my attention that that was hampering my growth. So I worked on listening to understand as much as possible in order to get all the buy-in and have a better understanding and being focused. Because when we can do that, we can adapt to anything that's out there. Anything I love that. And you're absolutely right. People do interject. They do jump in. It breaks the train of thought. That breaks the communication. Shouldn't we be better? I mean, isn't improv also a little bit about active listening? The better listener you are, the better you are going to think on your feet, the better you are going to communicate. I'm sorry. What did you say again? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I, and, and, but it's, it, it's so it's easier said than done. It's it, because the noise is coming up. Self-talk comes in. Our ego starts playing with it. And, and, it, and it's hard to duct tape our, our inner critic, especially in these conversations, that we really need to push them aside. And we need to be 100% present and in the moment and not thinking about, am I supposed to pick up the kid at soccer practice tonight? You've just missed something. Or that self-talk going... God, I, 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 wish, I wish Jamie didn't have that White Castle suitcase behind him in that, in that frame. Now on my way home, I'm going to have to stop. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm doing a book launch party. I apologize. I got distracted. <laughs> so what are some of the other seven foundations of the improv? What else do we need to know to make sure we as business leaders are getting more into what you're designing here for us? The, the, the foundations I've laid out, which is respect, trust, support, listen, focus, adapt, and the two magic words, yes, and. Maintaining that yes, and philosophy. We don't have to say yes, and all the time, but it's about agreement, it's about agreement, but not always agreeing. Yeah, how do you feel when, when you've got an idea that, that you go in and tell your boss, hey, I got this great idea about maybe we could do this to help the business, and the boss goes, I'm sorry, no, because uh, we don't have it in the budget but they didn't even listen to your idea. How does that, does that make you feel appreciated? Not at all, no. Uh, uh, a stat that I found in doing the research, 78% of people leave a job because of lack of appreciation and the ability to listen to somebody's thoughts and ideas. And it may not be right now, but making time for them when there's less distraction goes a long way in showing appreciation. And it's always remembering it's about them. It's not about you as the leader. You're there to help them grow. You're helping them build and you're help them shine. And when things fall apart, you fall on the sword and take the blame. You don't throw your team under the bus. I love hearing that. And again, that's exactly so, so much what your book helped us go through that. Speaking about the book, chapter 11, there was an interesting line I found here that no one will ever follow you down the street if you're carrying a banner. And it says, quote, onward toward mediocrity. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true, but can you explain that a little bit more? There's a lot of companies, actually I had an interesting conversation uh, with someone the other day that kind of fell into that because it, it's a large organization and, and they said at the local level, they can do a lot of stuff that can impact the business. But when they take these ideas up to the chairman, up to the top, no, 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 we're, we're going to be conservative. We're going to be safe. 20% is good. And I'm going, what happens if you could get 40%? Well, it goes, what happens if you get 10%? And it was like this, wait a minute. You, 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 you want people to follow you down this road of mediocrity versus, hey, let's do something exciting here. Let's, do, let's take some oh, risks. And, and risk is good because, <clears throat> you know, one of the downsides of corporate America is when you take a risk and you, and you fail, you're punished for it where actually fail is an acronym, first attempt and learning. My father was not that type of person. It took me a long time to realize the more that I failed, the better I learned. 
as long as I'm not making the same mistake over and over and over and over and over. And it goes to building that culture of excitement, culture of, of wanting to come into work. And, and, and I, I, will, I will just say this, and, and Jamie, you owe me $20 for to say this, but I understand White Castle's culture very well, and they're very much like that. People love to work at White Castle. People don't leave White Castle because they have that essence of their organization, that essence in their culture, and it works. I don't know why more people don't grasp onto it, more organizations. Great point. So what is the one mistake? Because again, you're talking about the ways that we should be doing it, but what's the one mistake most people do when they think about improv and how can that be turned around? Uh, I, I, you can't make me funny. I don't want to be funny. This is, this is business and this is serious. You know, that improv stuff, that's just, you know, it's like I've been fighting that, jumping that, hitting that wall for years. And what really, I, I think the Martin Luther King story really got people's attention. Because mm -hmm. I would tell them, and I, I have even workshops that would be great. We'd have a lot of fun. And then some would go, I don't really know how to apply this. I said, I can help you. No, no, that's okay. I don't, I, I kind of like the way we have it. And it's kind of that, well, this is the way we've always done it. It's good for now. But that can be that whole mediocrity thing. Why not try to build the best organization, the most exciting organization, a place where people want to come to work, a place where they have a voice, that they have psychological safety, that they can say things that might be deemed crazy, but it's accepted and not punished. You're I've allowing them to be creative. You're, you're yeah. allowing them to be creative and go off script. Right. So you can imagine, I spent some time in public accounting and, and I, I would come up with some crazy ideas and, and I was deemed, oh God, here he comes again. No telling what's going to come out of his mouth this time because I didn't square peg round hole. I didn't fit that conformity level. So I was not, I, I was kind of banished. So there wasn't that psychological safety, but when you allow it to happen, you'll learn a lot from your people and they'll come up with some ideas that might seem to be crazy at the time. When you get crazy and you get safe, you get bandwidth to find something in the middle. And that's the beauty of yes and and improv. So Peter, last question before we take a little break here. What's the biggest takeaway that you want everyone to really get out of this book? Well, if you got to sum it all up, what, what's the big thing? Remember those two words. I think, I think Jay Suko, when I first met him, I actually, I'm, Jay, I'm going to call you out right now because I don't think you got rid of this. I, 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 I've never met him. I, I interviewed him on my podcast and I met him and Greg Kondarachi and his daughter Annie in Chicago. Uh, and I was walking to this restaurant thing and I saw this guy leaning against the wall like this. And on his forearm, he had these two words. Yes, and. I have two cufflinks. I wear, yes, and. I have this blue bracelet, wear it all the time, yes, and. I keep this in front of me at all times. When I was first learning and, and delving into it, I had index cards, post-it notes. And, and yeah, I have fallen off the yes, and wagon a number of times, but I've been able to get back up and on it quickly because I just keep that in front of me. And I've developed that as a mindset and a way of life and a way of my business life. You know, if somebody would have told me 15, 20 years ago, by the time I turned 50, uh, I was 61, I'm sorry, my math is not that good. I'm an accidental accountant. Uh, that I would have written three books. And my friends would say that weren't either a bar book or books with color with crayons. I would have told them they were crazy. But that attitude, that mindset, got me through the first, second, third. And there's going to be a fourth book. I'm going to call it the mind of Jamie Richardson because that is full of wealth and knowledge. It might take a while to write, but it would be a, it would be a great book to have. Peter, this has been great. We have more conversations coming up, open Q&A coming up as well. And again, Peter Margaritas, uh, the author of Offscript, Mastering the Art of Business Improv. And since we have been mentoring different friends and different people that have helped you along the journey here, we're going to bring another one in right now, the president and CEO of Polarit and uh, Certified Leadership Master, speaker and author, Roxanne Kaufman. Come on in, Roxanne, and join us for a minute here. And what do you have to say about Peter and Offscript? 
Wow, Trigger, thank you. I, I'm not quite sure to start after all of that. <laughs> that was great. Um, I would say this, I think the time has come. I mean, after the last couple of years, what we've been through, this is a perfect time for the, the genius, the, the dynamic uh, anomaly that Peter is, and I mean that in, in all of the best ways, between this, this incredible left brain of experience and strategy and, and uh, business acumen, entrepreneurial success, combined with these years, I might even say decades, at least a couple of them, in, immersed in the world of improv has come together in exactly the right moment in a world that needs exactly what Peter is talking about. And there is no better maestro to orchestrate this than this gentleman right here. Uh, this book is absolutely amazing. Um, when you were talking, Peter, it, I had a thought just now Yes, and is, is the magic sauce. It is the secret sauce. And it isn't, this is not just two words. This is an attitude. This is a philosophy. This is leadership because that's what opens other people up. I'm an executive coach. I work with folks all of the time who are stuck in these places where they're not being heard. All you gentlemen were just talking about, they're not being heard, they're not being listened to, they're not being appreciated and valued. And if someone would just turn the attitude and say, yes, and, it would change everything about that. Attrition rates would drop. I mean, it would just be, it would be an amazing thing. So this book, and this is, this is not just a book. It's a lifetime of experience and recognizing what, what humans are about, what leadership truly is about in business. So I would just say that this is not a game changer. It is a life changer. It is a business changer. It's, um, it's an incredible piece of work. And thank you, Peter, for bringing it to all of us. Thank you. Roxanne Kaufman, thank you very much for that. Appreciate that. Now it's your time, everybody. You've heard the conversation. You've got the frame up of the book a little bit. I would love to open it up to our question and answer. Again, stick around to the end. We do have prizes and giveaways that you do want to get a hold of. But let's open it up to you. And if you want to use a digital hand, use that little digital hand. It helps move you to the front of the line. We'll be able to spot you better. And just briefly ask your questions that we can uh, put our guests on the hot spot a little bit. Have a little bit of fun here with Peter. And who would like to go first? Who wants to ask the first question of the night? Or if you have a question, go through the chat box. We will try to stay on top of that. But please step up to the microphone and join us tonight. I see a hand, Teresa. Teresa Rell, step on up, please. Hi, Peter. So I have a question for you. Uh, when uh, my daughter was growing up, uh, her nickname was Princess Yes But, because it was Yes But, then there's something else. And we spent many years reorienting it to be the Yes And. What are you seeing about the new generation, the younger generation? How are you approaching them to adopt this Yes And? approach to life i think some of the new generation it's no because i want to do it this way or, or yes but a and think about the word but and no that, that stops conversation no in itself is a complete sentence and you can't move forward for that yes but is uh maybe i'm getting an idea uh, an opportunity but maybe i'm not if they want to move their careers their businesses in a, in, a, in a direction faster, adopting the yes and philosophy. Now, I, I do want to say this. I, I'm a firm believer that we can say yes to almost anything, even, even, even a nicer way of saying no, but there's one piece of yes and when, it, when it's something evil, when it's something pushing us across our ethical boundaries, it's no. Whatever adjective you want to put in front of it, I don't care, but it's, it ends in the no because that is definitely. Now, if, if somebody comes up and says, Teresa, do you got five minutes of your time? I got something I really need to talk to you about. And you're going from one meeting to the next. It's, yeah, I, 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 I will like to listen to what you have to say. And we need to find later, something later today, a, a time that's more conducive because I got to go to this other meeting. I'm not going to be present. Versus, no, I don't have time right now, but maybe we can meet later. And you've got two negatives in that 
sentence, it doesn't leave you with a really warm feeling. So just play with it. And we don't have to use the exact term, Jess Amber. We have to use that, that philosophy of agreement, but not always agreeing. Thank you, Teresa. Love the question. Thank you very much. And uh, who else? Rebecca, come on in, please, and unmute yourself and please ask the question. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Peter. Thanks so much. This is this is great. Great way to spend a Friday night. <laughs> um, so we have small businesses, and we have you know twenty. Our employees are mostly twenty somethings. <laughs> and so, what about those people who are kind of front facing to the customer? How do you? really encourage in them the yes and especially when you know you want to do everything to just keep them keep them working and not going to the shop down the road or whatever you know it's all about retaining our employees so it goes to, to the, the fact of, of listening how well are you listening to your employees now the employee today is very different than the employer was back in my day I mean, we were all just one big group and, and that was leadership. And we're going to be lead by that one philosophy. Today, that leadership model is almost a la carte. Everybody's a little bit different. And it's trying to find a way to connect with them in a way that they feel heard and, and they feel appreciated. But there still have to be some expectations that they have to meet. And, and uh, I did speak to a, a managing partner of an accounting firm, and, and they went to this whole new model way before COVID. And he said that with flexibility, it was a, it was a right, not a privilege. Mm -hmm. And when staff would abuse that right, they lost that privilege and would have to earn it back. So as, as a boss of mine, kind of as a boss of mine, when I was in the banking industry, I said, Pete, I'm going to give you some rope. You're going to do one or two things with it. You're going to either build a bridge or hang yourself. I still have scars, but I learned from those scars, those rope burns. So it's allowing them also to fail and, and trusting that they will learn from it. But I think it really goes down to just listening to what their needs are, what their wants are, and, and finding a way that we can come to some medium that everybody is comfortable with in this new environment and not something that we're just demanding that they do. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, I guess I was thinking about like always saying, saying yes and to the customer. Okay. Uh, and saying, there's ways of saying yes and. It's yes, I, yes, Rebecca, I hear what you're saying. And have you thought about this? Mm. Uh, yes, Rebecca, I, I, I understand that this product maybe didn't um, uh, meet your needs. And could you tell me a little bit more about how you installed it or what you did so that I can have a better understanding? Because maybe there's something that we can do to help you. It, it, it's, it's providing that, you know, that, that, that excellent customer service mm -hmm. and, and being, it, it can get frustrating, but being as calm, cool, and collected as we can, trying to leave the emotion out and just go on a fact-finding tour. That's great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Rebecca, that was great, wonderful. Who else has got a question tonight? Raise the digital hand, move on to the front of the line. And Peter, maybe as if someone's thinking about their next question, how much of this is mental on our leadership? How much do they have to make a mental change and maybe even a heart change to open up this new attitude and the, and the new way of leading? Well, I've told a number of people that this book isn't for everybody. There are those, I'm not naming any names or whatever, but there are those people who will look at this book and just call it absolutely nuts. This is not how you lead. And it kind of goes back to that old school ego leadership. I'm going to tell you what to do, cheeks in the seat. Um, and, and that's fine. But I, 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 even with those folks, just pick it up and just try to read it with an open mind. You might actually pick something up in here that you could apply in a way to help your business in a way to empower and excite your people because by the way rich what business are you in what business am i in yes. communication coach leadership coaching that's a byproduct of the business that you're in rich you're in the people business that's the yes. business we all are in first and foremost everything else is a byproduct so once we start you know we say people are our greatest asset start treating them like they are with trust 
respect, and support, it goes a long way, especially in today's environment. I love the idea of a leader giving more trust and, and giving that rope. I, I, I love that you're pressing in on that here tonight. Charity, great to see you. Jump on in and ask your question of Peter tonight. Hi, Hi Charity. Peter. Hi, Peter. Okay, so my question is this. I've applied this theory, well, whole process actually with my youth group and it has worked tremendously. Um, they really started to grow once I included them on that yes and level. So the youth, they really do like it. I'll, I'll say that. My question is, we want to open a restaurant. Staffing is a real big issue. How would we apply the yes and to get that across that that's how we actually operate? Because our employees are going to be very, very important to us. But so many are so shut down and so kind of gun shy of employers in our area. How could I take that and actually apply that to the hiring process? It goes to the attitude. What attitude are you bringing to the interview? Well, are you coming in? If you want your people to have a good time and serve the customer and be at their best, you have to bring that energy into that conversation when you hire them. You have to get them excited about it and you have to walk that talk. Uh, a lot of times we, 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 you know, the, the recruiting process, the sales process so well. And then when we get into the organization, it's like, oh dear Lord, what just happened here? I, I, and, and I, I, I had a gentleman who I knew and, and it was like, this recruiting process was great. My first day and interacting with him was like a whole different person. Who in the, what the holy cow. And it was just a miserable experience after that. If you want people, and especially in a, in, a, in a customer service environment like a restaurant, I'm Greek American. I know a lot about restaurants. It's the owner's attitude about, about serving the customer and give them the best possible service and, and not, not, not just giving just average service. But with, with that positive mental attitude and, and, and adopting the improv approach by you and you teaching them by walk, having them walk to see you walk to talk, their attitudes will change and that energy level will come up. And then it's also management's job when they're coming in the dragon tail, you gotta get them moving. You gotta get, the, gotta get, get, gotta get them fired up, whichever way possible. But I mean, that's, that would be my advice. It, it, it all falls back on the leader to create the environment. Phenomenal, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thanks, Charity. Great question. I see another one coming in. Olian, come on in and ask your question. Great to see the hand up. Thank you, Rich. Uh, wonderful job, Peter. Thank I just you, want Rich. to cheap in um, in terms of what Charity mentioned about you know how do you how do you communicate to you know your team or your employees, and it falls back to the 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 values of the leadership or the owners and what you hold as values is what trickles down to um, the employees or the, your team. I remember, you know, way back some couple of years, I came across um, a quote that says, you know, um, from the CEO to the janitor, we, we give the same respect. So when, when you have that mindset as a leader, you're passing that down, it cascades down to every level to show the kind of respect, which is one of your values. You know, respect is there, um, you know, uh, what kind of whatever values that you hold. And of course, it also boils down to having a servant leadership attitude as a leader. You know, um, when we're called to to leadership, at times is misconstrued as you know bossing or lording over people. But you have been given an opportunity to serve, to lead people by example. So often at times, you know, we get that definition wrong. So it's servant leadership that I want to add and also the kind of value. So when you have that, um, you know, from the janitor to the, to the CEO, um, it's the same respect. So, and you having to leave those values because it's one thing to say, these are our values. And it's another thing as a leader to exemplify, to show those values that you are actually leaving by that rule, or by that creed, you know, and you're not yelling at, 
the janitor or you're yelling at whoever is in the you know printing machine room or something you know so 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 for me leadership um has to be redefined it's not it's not it's not something new but the great resignation is a call to for us it's a great awakening to re-engineering you know leadership to how do we see a great movement of people leaving corporations leaving companies that means there is something totally wrong fundamentally so, so peter, that's so those are all great points wonderful so peter what does the value system of the leader in this new paradigm that you're describing what is that value system and how do you communicate that in the way you're kind of laying this out as you were telling your story it made me think of two people one herb keller former ceo of southwest airlines he was known to speak to his ramp agents, to his agents, to the people who put fuel, to the pilots, to the flight attendants at the, at the same level of respect. He never looked down at anybody. And he always said, people are our greatest asset. We, will, we won't lay off people in the airline industry. We'll cut other costs to survive because without our people, we can't survive. And the other person made me think of was Simon Sinek. And he's got this, he has, I found this quote that he said once, he said, leadership has nothing to do with your title. True leadership is the ability to have a positive effect on another human being. And a few days after I heard that, I was actually coming back to Columbus through uh, 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 Reagan National, about nine o'clock, walk into the men's room and it's hustle and bustle. And there's this guy there and he's cleaning that bathroom spotless. But you look at him and you go, man, he's, he's had a tough day. So I kind of stood next to him and I said, excuse me, sir. I just want to say thank you for what you're doing. I mean, I don't know what your day is like, but I'm just saying this is one of the cleanest bathrooms I think I've ever seen. And he kind of looked at me like, who's the crazy man over here? And he kind of stood up straight and said, thank you. Nobody tells, tells me thank you, not even my boss you were the first person to do it i went son of a gun cynic is right it's the positive effect we have on another person not the negative effect but people construe a title with leadership when they don't know how to even utilize it they think yelling is the way of utilizing leadership basically people there's there's so much in your book that goes from leadership as being power to leadership being heart and relationship that's a lot of what this book is about and making that change, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to bring on another one of your friends. You've, re you've referenced him a couple of times, Jay Suko. And Jay is the co-host of Improv Cast with Jay and Landon. He is currently before him to the group Zero Hour. And he also has a monthly improv show called Improv Famous. And he has taught and performed improv and sketch comedy around the world and has performed professionally for 25 years. We were having so much fun backstage. So, Jay, welcome. What do you have to say about your good friend, Peter, and about this amazing book, Off Script? Uh, thanks, Trigger. And uh, Trigger, be honest, were you nervous about my last name? Because you asked me beforehand. I'm <laughs> always nervous about blowing a good name like that. But yes, we did it. We got through it. <laughs> you crushed it, man. You crushed it. Thank you. Great job. And uh, what, a, what a great night. Uh, and what a great celebration of Peter. He is right. I have a tattoo right there. Uh, I wanted to name my uh, daughter, yes, Andra. And my, um, her mom said, absolutely not. And so I negotiated a tattoo out of the deal. And uh, my daughter's middle name is Day, which is Russian uh, takeoff of uh, die. Uh, so I kind of got my wish, but I was uh, I was very thrilled uh, when Peter asked me to be a part of this book. And uh, I have I have to say it was such a struggle for years for people to understand the power of improv outside of the stage. And then Peter comes along and he puts it in such good terms of like, here's the usefulness. It's no longer just this theory, but he gives you a bunch of exercises and things to do to work on these muscles and these skills. And we've been talking a lot today about yes and, and Peter lives and breathes that yes and mentality. 
And the one thing that he does too is, and he didn't talk about this, is you really got to yes and yourself. I mean, that's where it really starts with is you've got to yes and yourself. And and Peter has done that. And you gotta you gotta bet on yourself sometimes. And we spend a lot of times focusing on betting on other people or other businesses and things like that. And if we can turn that, even that philosophy of saying yes to yourself. Uh, I think it goes a real long way. And so Peter asked me to to be a part of this book. And I was like, uh, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm scared. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to write. And he did a great thing for me as an improviser. He gave me a deadline. He said, you need it. He, uh, he's like, and Kate as well, who's a tremendous, uh, his editor was tremendous. And they're like, have it by this date. And that's what I needed. And it goes back to knowing what the people around you need, right? It's like, what's the human need? And I think that's where improv comes in real handy is what is the need for this person? And how can I recognize that? And so when I, I sit and Peter and I talk, it's like, we talk a lot as just friends. And then we talk a lot about like, we believe in the power of what improv is and the power to make your life better, to make your business better. And it's like a cafeteria pick up his book, take what you can, and then leave the rest. See what works for you. And sometimes you read the book and you're like, oh, this tool he gave me was working right now. This other one isn't. And then a month later, you're like, oh, that other tool is working for me now as well. So if if you're okay and happy where, with where your life is now, great. But if there are moments where you're like, I could use something, I could use a tool, it's all contextual. So in these situations, pick out one of these tools. And like Peter says, give it a try see if it can work. Uh, and, and he does such a great job at taking those philosophies and applying it to real life situations and putting it in such a way that you go, oh yeah, I, I can zip through this book and I want more. So uh, Peter, it's it's such a, a, a an honor to be friends with you. Yeah, he, he said, we met through our friends, uh, Greg and Annie Kondaraci. And from that point on, our initial meeting was like, oh, yeah, this is I'm not sure where this relationship's going to go, but it's going to be here for a while. Jay, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you very hey, much. Jay. Jay Suko. I got it twice tonight. Jay. You crushed it. My, my, high tonight, right there, Peter, my high school principal. My high school principal didn't get my name right. And I, my brother and sister went to the same high school. So eight years of Sukos, 12 years of Sukos, he still didn't get it right. So, Rich, you crushed it, buddy. Hey, you know what, everybody? Thanks for the other hands, but we are going to move on to the prizes. We have some great prizes. I want to make sure we get into this. And by the way, Jay did touch on a really important fact of the book we've not highlighted. Peter, you have little questions and challenges and things for people to think about. You actually make them think, not just read, don't you? Right, exactly. Yes. There's exercises, there's thoughts. Have you thought about this? I, I, I have to call out Kate Colbert and George Stevens. Uh, the publisher and art director at Silver Tree Publishing, who did a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous job on putting this book together. When I first saw it, it, it even in, in the PDF form, I had this huge tear in my eyes. I couldn't believe what these guys created. They were absolutely outstanding. Well, we've got three different prizes to give away tonight. So we're going to see if he tears up again, everybody. So <laughs> we are going to bring out the, the magical wheel. Everyone here that's come in has registered for this your names are on the wheel and we always have fun with this and so you have to be present to win by the way that is one of the things about the c-suite magical wheel you must be present to win and we're gonna have an autographed copy of the special hardback edition that he literally got the first copy in just hours before we went live today and this is not going to be available on amazon this will not be available on amazon so this is a real great deal let's have the team uh roll spin the dial all right, here we go. And this is where the improv comes in, Peter. You can do the Jeopardy music, whatever you want. Yeah, Lillian. All right, Lillian. Lillian. Are you still with us here tonight? Is Lillian still in the room? Yes, Lillian. she is. All right, congratulations. I am. Oh, wonderful, Lillian. I'm glad you won that. Thank you. Lillian, I'm we will thrilled, make sure the team Peter. This all... is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We will make sure the team gets in contact with you and get the email, uh, the address, the mail it, and do everything okay. properly. Wonderful. Congrats. Thank you. Congratulations. Bravo, Peter. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. So we're one for one. That's great. They're still with us, Peter. That's a good sign. Uh, now, now we're going to do the bundle. This is autographed copies of the paperback edition. Improv is no joke. Taking the numb out of the numbers and, of course, off script will be in this bundle as well. So, Peter, you're going to do the honors this time. 
Okay, let's spin the wheel. I think Drew Carey needs to do it next time. Andrew, is Andrew still with us tonight? Let's see if we're two for two this evening. We got, yes, Andrew is still with us. Andrew, jump on microphone for a second. How's it feel to win a bundle? Maybe you can't come on microphone right now. All right. We will move on to the final. This will be the autographed copy of Offscript Plus. Here it is, folks. This is what you've been waiting for. A one-on-one, 15-minute conversation with Peter himself. You get 15 minutes with this guy and a copy, an autographed copy of the book. Peter, one more time. Work, work the magic and spin the dial. Let's spin the dial there. Thomas Diebold, is Thomas still with us tonight? Absolutely, got... this is awesome. Now, Thomas also does stand-up comedy. So Thomas, what's it like to get an improv book for you? Like that to me is like just so amazing and I can't wait to talk to Peter. Um, I'm gonna learn to read so I can enjoy the book and this is gonna be fantastic. This could be a fun conversation, Peter. You have to record this one for us. Yeah, I think we do. I think we need to Zoom it and record it and, and, and share it with you, Rich. <laughs> Congratulations, Thomas. Thomas, what was your biggest takeaway of the night, real quickly, before we let you go? But what was your biggest takeaway? Um, psychologically safe. That was huge because so many places where I've gone in and wanted to share uh, for the good of the company and the customer and been shut down right away. And that's, I didn't feel psychologically safe, so I didn't stay. Thank you, wonderful. Look forward to that book. You know how to get in touch with us as well, Thomas, to get all the information. So Peter, we have a few minutes left here. We are running on time. A show about improv running on time. Can you think that was possible? Absolutely. We just improvised the whole thing. <laughs> and, and, and a good improviser starts and stops on time. So we also have, everyone can order a copy. We're gonna have the team drop a, the link back in again to order a copy of the book. You also have, you can uh, also get the other books as well. We have those links, those link, links in there. Tell us about your two other books briefly here. Tell us what they are about so they can understand why they should go get them. Right, well, first that link that we put in is the old link. Um, that might not take them to where they need to go. I said a new link and they have just, you, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Improv is no joke was my first one. It's about leadership in life. It was more kind of my story, talking about my story. And, and as a few people said, you were really vulnerable in, in this conversation. So it, 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 was, it was a fun book to read. If you, if you fly, you can fly from, uh, from Columbus, Ohio to LA, and you'll probably finish the book somewhere over Denver. Um, it wasn't a very long book, but it was, it was about 125, 130 pages. Um, and, and it's actually, just so you know, it's the perfect size to take to a restaurant because if your table wobbles, put this book underneath it, it won't wobble anymore. It's, it's that multi-purpose book here. Um, taking the dumb out of numbers, I'm, I'm a non-practicing CPA who is on a crusade to get accountants and those in the financial and technical worlds to start speaking plain English not their foreign language of engineering and accounting and how can they bring numbers? How can they bring all that stuff to life and, and have an impact on their audience? Um, and, and this one has been a very successful book as well. I, I'm still, this thing is three, four years old. And I just did a, a keynote this week, yesterday uh, for Oklahoma State University. And they loved it. They, they pre-ordered 400 of the books. So I know. Congratulations on that. Kind of like that. And then this, this, the new one's my baby. The, the new one is, I, I'm so excited about this book. Through the whole process, I kept saying, there's something really here. There's something that I hopefully, as, as uh, the, the, the uh, person who had mentioned about servant leadership, mm -hmm. this really made me feel that there's a, it meets that same definition and maybe just a little bit more. And, and, and I hope it has an impact. And for those of you who do buy the book, let me know your thoughts. Post a, post a review on Amazon. I'd greatly appreciate it. And I greatly appreciate you all taking time out on a Friday evening and, and spending it with us for an hour. I'm, I'm overwhelmed and, and just in, in awe of 
what has happened this evening. Peter, you get the final say here before we wind it down. What's the final thing you want to make sure everyone understands about Offscript and Peter Marguerite's? You know, just be yourself. Just be yourself and serve others. Uh, and, and, and leadership, that's what it's all about. And, and, and the other thing I'll say is embrace your quirkiness. Uh, I, I, in this book, I talk about being, being strategically silly. We do need to start having some fun. And when we're strategically silly, we can come up with more ideas and we can have fun. So I'll, I'll leave them with, with, with that, Dr. Richard. Told me Peter, to keep it's been a my privilege and an honor. It's been so much fun to work with you and get this book launched ready to go. Hey, until next time, my name is Rich Bontrager, The Trigger. And again, congratulations from Peter Margaritas on the launch. And thank you everyone for being here tonight to help the launch go successfully with Offscript, Mastering the Art of Business Improv.